what seems like tag team month here on the Wrestling Perspective podcast. It's Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell. Lars, I'm clueless. When you have the Impact Tag Team Champions, where do you go from there? Well, obviously, you get the AEW Tag Team Champions. Is that's right. that's what that's what we're gonna do. The Gun Club coming up next, but before we get to the Gun Club. Let's knock out a few of your questions. We won't hit that many of them this week just because we're against the uh, tr- tr- trigger. The clock. Yeah, the clock. But we're going to get to as many as we can. Dan from Florida, Lars and Dennis, can you please settle a fight between me and my friend? I won't tell you our opinion this week. Can you please rank these wrestlers? And then I changed them just so we don't have any subliminal rankings in there from them. Malachi Black, Sammy Gu- Guevara, Swerve Strickland, Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks, Swerve Stick, Strickland, Malachi Black, and then whatever the last one was. <laughs> Sammy Guevara. Yeah. I agree at 100%. Now, I could see you guys flip-flopping uh, Swerve and Ricky, but I think right now Ricky is on top of his game. And- yeah, yeah. That's the thing. It's kind of like I would give I would give it to Swerve on number one just because I like his what he does and I like his mind for it. But Ricky Starks is just – I mean, we've had him as a guest, obviously, on this – on this program and you know the confidence that he oozes but there's like a great there's like a there's humility with that confidence which i really love about his personality as a human being uh there's 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 no reason why he shouldn't be uh uh, in in contendership for the world heavyweight championship i think he's two years away from being number one on that list i mean he's right there he just needs a little bit more for me almost grab it yes yes uh it's only a matter of time but we have a dewey from boston uh, oh yeah i'm pretty excited for that one in today's era in wrestling in today's era of wrestling what's more important entrance music in the entrance presentation or in-ring wrestling abilities well that's a loaded question because i think you need all of them but um i would say if anything you need psychology <laughs> You need psychology and the ability to storytell, which I guess would be the in ring, you know, but that's also out ring too, you know? So um, I think that's one thing that needs, that's, that's, it's kind of like, you know, if those other two things were mentioned in that question, that would be my answer. But I can't just say one of those things is more important than psychology or storytelling. It also depends on what promotion you're watching, because I think the lower promotions rely more on wrestling ability than it does in ring or entrance music and whatnot because of budgets. See, that's where they go fucking wrong. It's like, here's the fucking trip. Professional wrestling is about storytelling. It's about making me believe that you really hate somebody, which is part of the psychology. You can go in there and do 150 fucking flips. That might impress me for a second, but once I've seen it, I've seen it. Uh, I, I agree. And but as far as WWE is concerned, I think it's really the music and presentation. I, I think the average WWE wrestling fan, the average, the one that doesn't know wrestling exists outside of that universe, doesn't care about in ring ability. Well, this is where I will say that I kind of agree and disagree with you because WWE is very much I mean, if you watch Raw you maybe get 20 minutes of wrestling the whole show, okay? Which sucks. That's one of the reasons why I tune out more than I tune in. Uh, Because I'm there to watch wrestling. They want to tell the story outside of the ring. That's kind of what, you know, it's always promos. It's always this. It's always this. It's always some stupid Miz TV show or something. You know, I'm over that shit. But uh, they do try to emphasize the storytelling. Uh, Matthew Patrick wants to know you guys talk a lot about what you liked uh, growing up in different wrestling promotions what was the best merch you ever bought as a kid i don't uh, even ask this one no why don't you go ahead uh you know my folks were kind of poor so we never really got a lot of merch when we went to a wrestling show i think you know I, I remember being 10 or 12 and for Christmas, I got a WWE shirt from Santa Claus. Uh, I don't think I have ever gotten anything when I went to the WCW shows. Cause we used to go to center stage all the time as boy Scouts. You know, I, it, it, this is going to be really embarrassing. I think the, I think the first merch I really bought was when I went to GCW 
and I got a GCW shirt because, you know, they were really cool letting me in and I, I want to get back to the promotion. So I would go with my first real merch thing because my neighbor always got all the cool stuff and I got to wear it off of him. So I'm going to say my GCW shirt. Well, the first shirt that was ever purchased for me was a four horseman shirt. And I have looked because I went to go see the great American, me and my friend, Derek Calvo, his dad, Tom, who was like my dad. Uh, took us to go see the Great American Bash on tour. Uh, he bought me a Four Horsemen t-shirt. And I have since to this day cannot find that Four Horsemen t-shirt. It was very specific in the way it looked. Now, people have tried to find this t-shirt for me to no avail. So I don't ever know if I'll ever find that shirt again. Uh, Paul from Ontario, and this has been sitting in the email for uh, quite some time, and I've been waiting for the best time to uh, bring this up. I've noticed on past podcasts when Lars and Dennis disagree, Dennis tends to back down and not push it because he's such a pussy. Why is that? Uh, you you know, it's the role we play, right? I'm smart enough to know oh my God. that, that um, I'm smart enough to know that I've got an opinion, Lars has an opinion. We're probably not going to change each other's mind, and nobody wants to see us really argue. We're not accomplishing anything if we argue over a point of who's a better wrestler or why do you like this guy and not this guy. So my job is to listen to Lars. Your job is to shut up and listen to us. So, Well, but also I have to listen to you because – and a lot of people don't understand, and maybe they, maybe they do. But if, if there's no Dennis Farrell, there's no Wrestling Perspective podcast. So – with that being said, all your kudos, you know, that I've given to you now, shut the fuck up and go on to the next question. Uh, I tell you what, just because you said that we're not going to do any more questions. I I'm going to give a gift to the people because I'm a giver. And my gift to the people is the gun club, Austin okay. and Colton. How about that? All right. That's fair. All way right, guys. Up, way to stand up for yourself. D. Thanks. Uh, in just a second, the gun club uh, hang out and we'll be right back Let's do it. Lars Fredrickson, it's time for the gun club here on the Wrestling Perspective podcast. The guns. The guns. The guns. I, we I, dropped the club once we dropped my dad. Oh, well, it's time, it's time for the guns here on the Wrestling Perspective. There we go. I See, I'm a fast learner, guys. I don't want to brag. Despite what I mean, the yeah, that was quick. say about me. Yeah, that was real quick. Congratulations. Hey. Uh, it's that Georgia school system. I'm not going to want to brag too much about it, guys, but just trust me, it, you don't want to go to school there if you have to again. Um, but now that I'm done burying the South in their school system, uh, Austin Colton, thank you so much for making time. AEW Tag Team Champions, we're really excited to have you guys. What's going on? Thanks for having us. Yeah, and thanks for saying we are the tag champs. Well, no we problem. Are, you know? we, we acknowledge greatness here on this podcast. I can tell. Somebody. I can tell. Hence why we ignore Dennis. Yeah. I'm not even here half the time. That's how awesome this show is. Uh, all right. Listen, I'm going to jump back in uh, and start asking some questions because we have a limited time with you guys. And I've listened to a lot of interviews with you both. And I am super impressed with how quick you guys have risen in the wrestling industry. Uh, it's no secret who your dad is. It's no secret who you guys have been trained by. But we we talk a lot with younger guys about how there's no quality control in wrestling. And yet you guys come out and kind of are a step ahead of everybody around your age and how long you've been in the industry. Do you guys, all right, you're still young enough. Do you guys kind of understand how far ahead you are of everybody in about your age range? Um, It took me about a, it took me about six months to realize that. Uh, when you go into a class, I was really scared going into my first class because it's uh, going into the unknown. You're a second generation. You're getting trained by Billy Gunn and being in the ring. People expect you to be great right away. Um, and uh, I was pretty nervous on my first day of training. But then six months into it, I started realizing that I was kind of bypassing my students that I was in the ring with. And then I was I was just picking it up really quick like you are. Um, I had the Florida educational system, so I, I learn even quicker than you. So. Um, just being a second generation, being around in my entire life, learning from dad, learning from the other coaches that I was able to be around and surround myself with asking them questions 24 seven, it just came natural. And then when Colton came into it, um, I'm sure he has a different experience, but that was my experience. I just, I started catching on and you couldn't stop me. Yeah. And I, um, 
yeah, I've only been doing this for two years. You know, me and Austin have been, you know, on our own for six months or so, like a year without my dad. But um, yeah, kind of the same deal. Once I went to school, I was like picking it up a little faster than everyone. And that's just subconsciously having your dad, you know, watching him growing up and then realizing, you know, once I was an AEW, like six months in or something, I'm wrestling Sting with my dad, you know, and that's not something that happens. It usually takes five years to get to the stage we're at. Whereas it took me 12 weeks to get to AEW and now we're the tag champs two years in. So it's crazy, but I mean, I hold myself to a really high standard and I came into this later than my brother, who's younger than me, which is really weird. And I just took it as like, I have to catch up. So I would train every single day. I'd go to, I'd ride to Jacksonville with them and then go back early on Thursday just to get to class for extra work. Cause I knew I had to catch up and knew I had to get to that level and it hasn't stopped since then. Like I still, once we get off the road, we still go train. Like it doesn't stop. We're the hardest working people there is. And, you know, that has paid off. We're the champs. So, And we only started with seven bucks in our pocket. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> um, well, you know, my I guess my question for me, for, for you guys being brothers, you know, second generation, we've had a lot of, you know, obviously second generation wrestlers, fourth generation wrestlers, shit. So many of them on this program as a father myself and being a musician, you know what I mean? Everybody sort of expects one of these kids to be musical and they both are, but that's not their life choice their, or their life path. Training with your dad. I mean, is, is he harder to, to, li to listen to in a lot of ways? Meaning, you know, taking advice from him is what was that easier or harder for you uh individually um i think me and colton learn in different ways as uh i i came up in football and lacrosse and i like to be yelled at and i like to be um uh when my dad used to yell at me in the ring and beat me up it was more of like uh okay i'll show you how to do it like i'll show you that i'm capable of doing this like oh i made that mistake oh watch this i'm not gonna make it ever again so it was more like a, me proving to him um, that I really wanted it because I came straight out of college and he said that we, me and Colton had to get a degree first before we even tried this. So when I went in the day after I graduated, it was kind of like it was me proving to him that I really wanted to be there. So um, I think just, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, that's it. It's just I yeah, like to I be think, yelled uh... at and stuff like that. Yeah, when you ask if it's hard to listen to my dad, it's not because he's been there, done that. He's a Hall of Famer. So, like, who better to listen to? And he knows exactly, like Austin said, how to push your buttons. So Austin is, like, yell at, whereas I'm just uh, more of, like, explain to me why that was wrong. And then I'll go do it right the next time. And, uh, like, backstage when we're putting our matches together and everything like that, like, he uh, – he helps and we listen to him like i'm i'm a big proponent of if you've been there and done that i'm gonna listen to what you say and my but, dad has and he's your dad so yeah but sometimes the funny thing was when we were working with him and we would we would me and colton wanted to venture out our own and try our new ideas out there um it's kind of hard to listen to him sometimes when he said some something won't work because as young up-and-comers we want to try new things we want to see if something will work and he usually explains why it won't work, but he always gives us the freedom to do it. He goes, hey, listen, I'm just going to show you or explain to you why this might not work, but you can go out and do whatever you want. So sometimes <laughs> we would get upset uh, with ourselves because like, man, we really want to try that out there, but dad says it's not going to work. So there were times where we went out there and failed and learned from it and said, oh, dad was right. And there's times when <clears throat> we went out there and maybe, maybe it wasn't the best choice, but we're all working together and trying to make the best product so it's hard to listen to him sometimes in that aspect yeah right. and maybe well, guess, uh right. yeah i was just gonna say maybe not listening to him is the way because he's not with us right now and we won the tag team titles so yeah oops maybe we know better <laughs> <laughs> well you don't but um no i'm just kidding but no do you I have the aw go. tag straps uh no but i can probably go buy them if you want me yeah. to, I'll show up, show up to the next one. Um, I'm on Etsy right now. Going to get them. <laughs> no, but, but no, I guess but the point of my question is, you know, what I was trying to get as is the fact that even though your brothers, there's two different, there's, there's two individuals here with individual personalities. My kids are not the same. That's what I was trying to get at. But one of the things that I caught when you were, when you were talking was that you, you sort of 
uh, put out there that you had, uh, you, you know, this is something that you wanted to do as far as you wanted to be a pro wrestler. So, um, you know, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, get in a little bit more of that, of uh, that, you know? Um, yeah, I actually, I, think... I, I actually never really wanted to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> like I did my own thing. I, uh, I graduated college. I, you know, worked in the corporate world. Then I moved to LA and was building um, custom houses out there. And I saw my brother and dad wrestling. And I was like, if I'm 50 and I never try this, I'm going to be super disappointed in myself <laughs> and I'm going to regret it. So I'm not going to do that. So I quit my job and moved back to Orlando, which is a little different than Austin, but I'll let you tell that. Yeah, I um went through lacrosse, got a scholarship for lacrosse. And then um once I was in there, I was I majored in second second generation or sorry, elementary education. So I taught second grade. And then when I was teaching the class for my last year of senior year, I was like, man, I'm an entertainer at heart. I love physicality. And I've always at least love my dad watching him in the ring and be entertaining and entertaining people in general. So I didn't know if I was going to love professional wrestling, but I love the idea of entertaining thousands of people and, and uh, being physical with people. And, and uh, I just gave it a shot. So I just went to training for a week, a week and a half. And right when I f stepped into the ring, I, I, I just loved it. And when I had my first match in Valdosta, Georgia, actually uh, with my dad, um, man, it was just off to the races from there. I just loved everything about it. And then I started really just falling in love more with it. Now, this question may not be fair, considering you both are AEW tag team champions right now, but you, you see a lot of tag teams at some point, they they run their course. Have you guys like actually sat down and talked about like what a singles run for each of you guys would look like? Maybe a five-year plan and how long you guys plan on taking it as a tag team? Um, I think I, I brought this up to Colton the other day, uh, just just because I thought I had to be a singles wrestler because I came in with dad being his his tag partner. And we were the gun club at the start without Colton. And obviously, dad won't wrestle forever or, or he might. I don't know. He's a freak of nature. But yeah. I had it in the back of my mind going like, oh, man, I'm going to be a singles wrestler my entire career. I don't know if I want somebody that's not my brother to be my tag partner. So I obviously had a vision of what my singles career would look like, but it never got to that point because right right when uh, I started having to think about that, Colton stepped into the picture. My dad kind of faded out into the background and trying to help us. So I haven't really thought about it. I don't think I'll ever have a singles career, maybe singles matches I'd like to have with somebody or my idols or my heroes down the road. But right now it's just, it's all about me and Colton and, and I don't see my arse, well, I don't see myself breaking off anytime ever. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. Like, I don't see, I've never wanted to be a singles performer. Like, if I was going to do this, I was going to do it with my brother. And our main goal was to be the tag champs. And we have accomplished that already, which is incredible. But um, what we each bring to the table complements each other so well. So it's hard to, like, think of ourselves as singles and pick up that slack from the other one, if that makes sense. But I mean, like Austin said, if there's an opportunity to have a one off or, you know, we have to do it for reasons, we, we would have no problem doing that. But I don't see or envision myself being a singles only singles performer. Well, you know, one of the things I've been watching wrestling for, you know, the majority of my life, my my favorite has always been the tag teams. I see AEW creating more of like a, a real tag team division. You know, other companies have them, yes. One of them doesn't really pay attention to them. One of them sort of cultivates that. Now, for what you guys are doing and saying like, hey, maybe we don't want to do this singles thing. Um, but I mean, is there aspirations to maybe go to Japan and do this? Is there, you know, is there, is there any other aspirations? Like any, I mean, are you feeling like sky's the limit? Are you happy where you are? You know, what, what, you know let me know about that. Um, I was originally supposed to be uh, in the New Japan Dojo when I first started. Things fell through in that aspect. But uh, my dad said it would have been a great learning experience for me to go over there. Because once you go over there for six months and and train in that style and you come back, you're a totally different wrestler. Um, I think now that Colton's in the picture and we're a tag team, I think it would be I mean, just the options are limitless. If we went over there for six months and really, really got after it, we would learn so much. So I don't I don't see any cons of 
going in that direction later later on or wherever it takes us but uh doing the forbidden door even even opportunities like that would be amazing for us just to keep on learning get in there with new people and just it just learn new styles yeah i was gonna say i love where we're at right now with aew they're awesome but they also do a lot of work with cross promotions as you've seen with ftr going to different stuff i hate to mention them but like that would be something cool if AEW is like, hey, we want to send you over to Japan for a month. We we could do that or triple wherever they wanted. But that would I would never say no to new opportunities to get better or to learn. So, yeah. So once again, being a young tank team in this industry and I, we had another tag team on last week and we asked him kind of the same question. You guys are so young. Are you? I guess young enough where you don't quite realize how much pressure you're under holding the the straps for a major company right now, or maybe is it worse being younger and and knowing you're holding the straps for a major company right now? I love the pressure, man. I've been getting this ever since I was a kid thinking about going into wrestling. It's everybody always doubts you. Everybody always does. My own friends, high school friends, high school people passing me in the hallway, college buddies. Every time I mentioned that this is what I wanted to do as a profession, and then people in the industry knowing that I was second generation and fans then seeing me trying to get in this business. Ever since day one, people have put an X on, on my name like, oh, you don't try hard. You just got this position because of who your daddy is. But that's why me and Colton work so hard at this. That's why we are so crisp. That's why we learn fast. That's why we pay attention. Ask the vets in the back. We are constantly learning. We are not shy to grow and develop. I mean, we are learning live on TV. And I don't think anybody else could handle that pressure. Being a second generation, learning live on TV and being thrown in the deep end constantly, but constantly swimming. I say it all the time. It's like we're doing live promos on just on the fly, on live TV. We're facing the old tag team champs Jurassic Express live on TV as our first um, tag team match on TV. It's like we are constantly, constantly under pressure. So at this point, it's honestly just, it's honestly just normal to us to be surrounded by this much pressure. It's almost when we're not feeling pressure, which is very rare. It's like, it's like, what is going on? I love the pressure. Yeah. To just to add to that, I mean, that's the good answer, but like, we're constantly, especially being second generation, second generation, we're constantly on the microscope with all the fans. All they want us to do is to see us fail. It's like, see, I told you. So everyone can say, I told you so they failed, but we never do. And if without that pressure, I don't know if we would have that. But being thrown, like Austin said, our first tag match, me and Austin's first tag match on TV was for the titles in the main event of Rampage against Jurassic Express. And it was a great match. Our live promo will go three minutes and just do a funeral for FTR for like everyone had this opportunity to do all this stuff on the indies or everything. And we're doing it in front of a million people and we're doing it very well. And I don't think without the pressure we could. So we thrive under the pressure and we feel it for sure, but we don't let it affect our work. If anything, it makes us better. Well, you know, being second generation wrestlers, I know that there's obviously other pressures because, you know, like you both have been saying, they want you to be your dad or they want you to do this or or whatever it is, right? So the, that's a whole other thing that a lot of wrestlers won't understand. Do you ever confide or do you have friends who are also second generation wrestlers that you, because I mean, obviously that, that would be one major connection. Do you communicate <laughs> with, with any other second generation, third generation wrestlers who have been in your position, you know? Um, I keep in contact with Dominic Mysterio. Uh, I keep in contact with a lot of second generation from our own company, Brock Anderson. And it's kind of just like, you, I don't know if you, you don't ask them for advice. You don't ask them, Hey, I know you've been here before. It's kind of like this. It's honestly like you just step back and see each one kind of growing into their own. And I mean, Dominic Mysterio is on fire right now. And it's cool to step back and see how he's approaching his uh, wrestling career and how we're approaching our wrestling career and how Brock Anderson is approaching his career. It's just, it's honestly cool. And we always support each other. And I check in sometimes with Dominic, I check in with Brock, but, but it's never, it's never like asking advice. It's honestly like, Hey, I'm in your corner kind of thing. Keep on doing your thing. Yeah. We just, yeah. I don't know if, cause we're all trying to find our own way. So I don't know if you ask for support, but definitely like Austin said, just being in the corner and being like, I know what you're going through. Cause they're the only other people that know. So yeah, it's more like, uh, 
I know what you're doing. I see you proud of how you're handling the situation. Not like, Hey, what would you do if you were, you know, and kind of along those lines of question, you you do have second generation wrestlers like a Curtis Axel who goes completely left when his dad went right just to s- separate himself. And then you guys have a guy like a Ted DiBiase Jr. who somewhat follows in his dad's footsteps, a Cody Rhodes who follows in his dad's footsteps. When you guys are putting together a plan of being a tag team, brother tag team, do you guys sit down and go, well, we want to be like our father or – F that, how do we be our own people? Is there a, a mindset behind how you guys approach that? I mean, my dad is one of the greatest tag team wrestlers of all time. Absolutely. He's an 11 time tag champion. So, and we're his son. So, obviously, we're going to get a little bit from him, but we can't try to be something we're not and be exactly him. Like, we each have our own features and we each do, do certain things well. So, we have to dive into those. So me saying, okay, I'm going to start wrestling. I'm going to do exactly what my dad did. It's not going to work. The fans are going to see right through that and be like, well, he's just trying to be a carbon copy. But in terms of picking up psychology or things like that, that did work that my dad did, we'll pick up on that. But as far as trying to be exactly that, no, if that makes sense. Yeah, I I think it's hard for me uh, to not act like him because me and him have the same personality. So my movements in the ring, my, my, my personality in the ring, it's just me being me. It just so happens I, I get it from my dad. So um, Colton had a – that was a great answer. I support that and uh, second that. It's just it would be hard for me not to act like myself instead of trying to copy Billy. Do you think it, there's sort of a disservice for for younger wrestlers that like – I mean because you guys have been describing your experience that you're thrown straight into TV in these high-pressure uh, you know environments. I know that that you've obviously – um, overcome those things and you enjoy that but do you think there's a disservice for other wrestlers coming up not by not getting opportunities um, to work their craft on like on independent uh, circuits because it seems like there's a fast track now because there is so much uh, there's an a copious amount of wrestling now to be consumed you know so many different promotions and so your trajectory you know where you go you get there quicker So you're so sorry. So you're asking, is there a disservice to to younger wrestlers? Um, the, I don't know. Austin, what do you think? Yeah, I have no idea, to be honest. <laughs> OK, that's fair. Well, I, I, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to ask this question. And this is kind of a fan favorite question and a favorite of the podcast. When did you guys know they were going to give you the belt? Is there a cool story behind how you were told? Did you kind of always knew this was where it was going? Was it a surprise? I mean, we went out and just beat the acclaimed. I mean, that's how we got the titles. (laughs) And my dad tried to stop it and we hit him too. And we weren't going to let anybody stop us from getting those. So we beat the acclaimed, the uh, people's choice, the people's favorite. And they said the forever champs, but obviously not because we're better than them. That's right. my answer. No, no, great answer. <laughs> Lars? I was waiting for uh, the other one to answer if you wanted to. I second that. There was nothing stopping us that night from walking out of that building with the with the straps. Well, let me ask you this then. You're standing in the ring, young guys, the tag team division on your back. You're holding up the belts. Is there a moment between you guys? What do you say to each other in that moment of celebrating? Hey, uh, you know, our, our our very short careers. Here we are at the top of the mountain. Is there a moment in that ring that you can share with us that you guys had? Man, I'll just say this. It's a, I think it's a very different feeling when the people are rooting for you. When the people are rooting for you and you have an underdog story and you work hard and the fans are behind you and you win the titles – and everybody stands up and cheers. I think that's a different experience. We did not get that experience. We got the total opposite. When the fans are, when the fans hate you and want anything but for you guys to win the AEW Tag Team Championships, and then one, two, three from the referee, and you hold your hand up, and you look at Colton, and he's the only one in the arena happy for you, and you look around, and everybody's in shock and flicking you off and and screaming profanity at you and almost coming over the barricade, it's like, it's a different feeling. 
So it wasn't a, uh, oh my gosh, we finally did it. It was, uh, I mean, part of my French, it was F, F you guys. We told you. We told you from day one this was going to happen. We told you we were going to beat the acclaim. We told you we were going to beat dad. We told you this was going to happen. And when we when we ripped their hearts out from their be- like their best tag team, the acclaim, it's the best feeling for me. But it was a different experience. Yeah, and when we got that one, two, three, and I just – we won, and Austin's just covering bones. I was like, we did it. We got them all. We sucked <laughs> the air right out of this building. I hate every single one of you. Me and my brother, the only people that believed in each other, and we were standing on that ramp. I mean, it didn't even hit me until, like, a couple days later that we were the tag champs. Like, But we did it, and we proved everyone wrong that we weren't – you know, we did it. So. When it comes to the ideas that you guys are bringing to the table, where do you find your inspiration? Is it from movies? Is it from comic books? Is it from video games? Is it from, I mean, where are you drawing the inspiration for who you are and how your characters are developing? I like to, I like to be the kind of the designer of our team. Um, So I, um, I like to draw some inspiration from Shawn Michaels. I think that's my personally personality inside the ring. Um, so when it comes to gear, I love putting together our gear. That's my inspiration uh, with the zebra and just flamboyant colors or just looking badass. It's like that's what I take care of. Um, I love pulling quotes from like Tombstone or like I have a whole sleeve from like my favorite Westerns growing up. So like Tombstone in our favorite movies, obviously, we'll pull inspiration from that. Um, Colton, you want to take over? Yeah, mostly all my stuff. Like I like to think about different stuff what we could do in terms of like um, different approaches to storyline stuff like that and honestly it just comes to me pretty naturally like I don't really have to sit down and think about it but all of that comes to me when I'm either driving or working out at the gym and then I will come back and I will pitch it off Austin he's like oh that's awesome and then we'll kind of go from there but in terms of our look and music that kind of goes towards Austin and then in terms of angles story stuff like that that kind of is me so like i said before we bring each bring something to the table that's why our tag team works colton this might be a stretch of a question but uh Mm -hmm. i listened to an interview a couple interviews and you were talking about your construction work days and Mm -hmm. my memory's a little foggy so uh, pardon this but i think it was breeze or fandango breeze or fandango that uh, helped train you at one point right or you went in and did some wrestling with one of the two uh breeze and sean spears they have a school here in orlando called flatbacks so that's the one i i know breeze does some construction stuff did you ever work construction with him i it's a dumb question but i always kind of wondered since (laughs) you kind of knew you did construction i know a dumb question fanboy question honestly no 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 no. it's not a dumb question at all no so he does like kind of more real estate flipping and renting out like properties here in orlando i was in la so i was building houses so i was in charge of like the whole construction process so i was in charge of scheduling and like homeowner stuff and i had like two assistants working for me so when i came back i gave all that up but we talk about it sometimes at school um but i had nothing we've never worked together in that realm okay Lars. yeah Yeah, i'm kind of thinking about the opponents you know that you guys have had so thus far is there somebody that you know, you, maybe there's a dream match for the both of you as a tag team. Um, maybe somebody that maybe not even in, in your own company that you'd like to to work with and, and get in the ring and wrestle around with. I mean, I think we want to, my answer is I want to wrestle all the brother tag teams <laughs> just, to, <laughs> just to prove we're the best brother tag teams, whether that's AEW or WWE. And there's a pretty big one in WWE that are brothers that I would like to uh face because they uh, their dad also wrestled my dad and i think it would be a pretty cool story but as far as aew you know we had a list and we've kind of wrestled all of them we've never wrestled the young bucks though so that would be awesome but yeah i think all the brother tag teams would be pretty cool yeah i think just to add on that i think um I mean, I mean, you think of the brother tag teams just in AEW. I second that answer, Colton. I think uh, you see like people like Top Flight, the Young Bucks. There's Matt and Jeff Hardy. I mean, there's just so many brother tag teams like that um, that I'd love to face. That'd be so much fun. Uh, so yeah, those are just an, a couple more to add on to the list. 
I know we're getting to the end of this and we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I know one of my last few questions is when you guys started the tag team division in all of wrestling was so much different, right? It was just starting to be rebuilt from what it used to be. Now, here we are, you guys are tag team champs. You look through all the companies, tag team wrestling is starting to come back. When you were in those early days of training as a tag team together, was there any worries about what the tag team divisions look like, what your futures could be like as tag team wrestlers, even on in independent circuits where tag teams were not getting paid to show up? Uh, well, one, I'll stop you there. We never went to the indies. We only had a handful of indies, so we never needed that. We were made for TV television. Um, so me and Colton, my only focus was to have fun and to continue learning. And then when it started getting a little more competitive and Colton started catching on and then Colton got signed and me and him were together, I think right, right before we had the Jurassic Express match, I think that's when we started going, all right, are you caught up? All right, I'm caught up. All right, let, let's start putting our like toes in the sand and start digging after this. So I don't think it ever became like a, oh my gosh, how are we going to fit in? Because we always knew we'd get to this point. Um, but but it, it, it just at a certain point, you start going, all right, all right, now I know where we fit in here. Let's start, let's start ramping this up a little bit. And yeah, and I also think it's, you know, it might sound cocky or egotistical or something, but if tag team wrestling wasn't featured, like you're saying, you're worried that, you know, companies aren't going to promote it. Well, me and Austin are going to be so good. You can't ignore it. Right. And you're going to, you're going to have to put us on TV as a tag team because that's how good we are. So I don't think that's ever been a worry. Like, Oh, if they don't start pushing tag team wrestling, where do we go? No, they're going to push it because we are here. Well, Colton and Austin, thanks you guys so much for your time, taking time out of your day. I'm finally glad we got to make this happen. As far as the social media, where can people find you both? Um, I, go ahead. I'm at the Austin Gun on Instagram and Twitter. I think I'm Colton Gun on Twitter and the Colton Gun on Instagram. The Guns AEW Tag Team Champions, guys, so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We uh, truly appreciate it. For everybody, the show's over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Farrell, the Guns. We'll talk to you guys all later. Thank you. Thank you so much.